Yep. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Cities of Blood Podcast. I'm Phil Lucero. I'm Alexis Terevko. And uh, there's a little bit of delay in our monitor, I can tell. Is there? Yeah, just a bit. Anyways, hopefully everything's uh, recording fine. So uh, we're back again this week. This is kind of like the last hot week of the summer, hopefully, right? Well, hot week for us. I think everyone else got theirs done like two weeks ago. Yeah, the rest of the country. But here uh, here in the capital city, it's it was 100 degrees today in late September, which is, uh, yeah. Just, and it was like a hot, it was like a hot, not a hot, like a, well, I don't know what you call it, like a. Stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a rough one. It's not easy to breathe when you go outside. Yeah, it was a, it was tough today. Yeah, hitting them, hitting them flights of stairs in all those apartments. That's right. Even uh, out there making them deliveries, Climb, climbing them stairs. Man, good cardio. Yeah, but this is crappy, you know, air, crappy yeah. weather to be doing it in. Davis doesn't believe in elevators. Oh, jeez, the Republic of Davis. So, the uh, anyways, this week we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. We were uh, we were just talking before this about the uh, about the homeless here in Sacramento. And the homeless of it's a massive issue. Period around the country, especially here in California, it seems lately. Not just uh, in the capital city, but no. down in the Bay Area and, and Los Angeles. And there's always been a, a draw to California, well, yeah, because weather wise, weather wise, right? I mean, if you, if you have to live on the street, you may as well live on a warm street, right? I'm going to live on the street. I'm going to San Diego, right? Yeah, San Diego. When I was uh, when I was a young man, uh, my mother lived. In... Were you stationed in San Diego when you? Were no, there? I no, was not. I was not. Um, I was going to ask how it was down there, but I've heard it's beautiful. No, no, no. I mean, like the homeless population down. That's interesting. You know, that's one area you don't hear about it, or at least I haven't. Well, I mean. I've been hearing about the, the, everybody talks about the Bay Area. Uh, it seems like San Francisco is really getting the front pages about the homeless right now. But we're starting to feel it here in Sacramento, too. We just had a, a recent study of um, of a huge E. coli outbreak in the American River. Anybody familiar with Sacramento knows that we're surrounded by two rivers. The, the capital city, anyway, is, um, I know I keep saying that, but it is surrounded by two rivers, the uh, Sacramento and the American River. And the American River is the one everybody swims in. Right. Right, because it's kind of just this lazy bend, you know. Um, and you can see the bo- – you can it's clear as compared right. to the uh, – The American. The, Amer- the Sacramento River, the Sacramento, rather, yeah, yeah. is muddy. And it's muddy from uh, from gold dredging, uh, from what I understand. 200 years ago. Yeah. Well, no, I've actually got footage. I've got footage from the 1930s where they were – okay, have you been to the gold museum? Have anybody been to the the, the uh the railroad museum in old Sacramento. Yeah. Okay. Outside the railroad museum where the Sacramento doesn't like every sixth grade class go there. I think it's mandatory yeah, if I you mean, live, if you live anywhere near Sacramento. Because I know I went there when I was I don't, I don't know fifth or sixth grade, and then I worked at an elementary school like as like a I don't know like a student like aide. Okay. And I remember the sixth fifth or sixth graders my junior and my senior year when I did that. They went and we went with them. Okay, so, we're talking so, twenty five years ago in high school, but but it's 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 a rite of passage ever since the the railroad museum was was put in in the seventies. Right. So it's a it's a great museum. Um, if you visit if you visit Sacramento, you have to visit the museum. But uh, to the gold rush part of it, um, right next door is the Sacramento History Museum. Right, and in between the two entrances, uh, kind of a little bit pushed back, is this giant shovel, and uh, I'll, I'll put a picture of it up on on this episode. And anyways, so this gigantic shovel was once attached to, and I mean, you could fit a Volkswagen Beetle in it. That's how big this yeah, shovel is. Yeah, it's really is. big. Right? Yeah, it's, it's massive. So, um, I mean, two or three guys, you know, could sit in the thing kind of right. thing. So anyways, this, uh, this was just one of like 200 of these things on a gigantic chain that, that literally went up down into the water, hit, scraped up the bottom brought it up and dumped it in piles and then I've got footage of these massive piles of rock hmm. um, and so they scraped all the rocks off the bottom and as a result all the sediment that's underneath the rock is no longer held down that's so you wild. have a cloudy area now and on top of that 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 affects salmon population fish because the fish lay their eggs in and around these rocks. rocks right 
So when they removed all that for gold, you know, looking for gold, um, and you know, I'm sure they sold off the gravel and everything else. That's oh, I'm sure they uh, they they completely destroyed that river bottom. Now uh, there might be some some uh, scientists out there, who, if, if any scientists actually watch this, that that argue. I've had some some conversations with a few of them. Do saying, we have to check our our uh, our so, status on our our. Uh, I think we're maybe seven seventy four subscribers, but uh, let's see if our. We'd be all we'd be very lucky if all seventy four actually watched this episode. This is how hot it is in Sacramento. I'm using an ice pack. We are at uh, seventy eight eight subscribers, so seventy six wow. if you don't count you and me. That's right. That's great. I do want I mean, to? We are grateful for that. But um, so what? Anyways, that that's that's why the uh, the Sacramento River is brown and muddy. Anyways, back to the the homeless thing. Anybody who wants to to swim or camp or anything or fish, you know, they always do it in the in the American River, and so the American River is this clear bend that you know kind of goes around the uh, the east side. Because that's city. the one that I I don't know if I don't necessarily live on it, but that's the one that goes through Ranch Cordova. The American from Natomas, Natoma, the no, no, no Folsom, Folsom, okay, Lake yeah. Natoma, yeah, <clears throat> but. The, the American, which is huge, so right. you see how wide the thing is. Um, apparently, there's like 300 homeless uh, can't shelter, t- uh, tents, you know, people, at least 300 people just living on it right now and, and crapping into the river. And so, as a result, there's this massive E. coli outbreak, and uh, people are some people are getting sick. <clears throat> and the city wants, or I believe it's the city of Sacramento, wants to... Um, waste six to eight hundred thousand dollars on a study to figure out where the e coli is coming from when instead they can just kind of like look on the riverbanks and say right. oh well if there's all these people living here yeah. and crapping here then obviously this is where you know the e coli is coming from i mean it's obviously not like you know oh there's it's just such a huge deer population on the american river or or or, or you know wildlife it's it's not wildlife well, and I, I think too is it's that uh, if you say it's the homeless, that means you're an evil person, and you can't come out and say it, but you have to have to do a study that says it. It's a real shame. I mean, even the homeless are offended by being homeless, right? And I don't, I don't want to hate on the on the homeless. I'm, I'm not hating on them. It's yeah. just the truth. It's if yeah. if you. If you, it's, we're in that day and age where it's their fault yeah. and the city can't come out and say it. Yeah. One, because it's, it's election time. Yeah. So. Well, and like you said, a lot of people get butt hurt and, and have this knee jerk reaction. I, uh, for example, there was just an article that uh, a, a, a fr- Facebook friend of mine had posted about um ban it said ban that this is how the news is fucked up sometimes i think it was the sacramento beer or somebody locally here said uh the headline was like uh banning homeless in sacramento or something like that okay the reality of of that particular situation was that they were uh i believe six uh people who happened to be homeless who were basically destroying these local businesses uh, by going in there, robbing them, chasing off customers, um, they were repeat offenders. Right. It's the and so everybody knew them. It was it was just these six people, and so Sacramento unfortunately had to take this step to actually ban the, these people from this area in order to to make it a crime for them to be there. So if they ever show up again, they can be arrested. And so, but these these idiots, you know, who are, are, are connected to this Facebook friend of mine, they don't even read the article. They just see that headline, that irresponsible headline, and they automatically like, oh my God, this is so bad. All the comments were so absolutely ridiculous. And I, I read the article. I'm like, read the yeah, article. Read they're the not article. banning homeless. Idiot. They're not banning homelessness. They're, what they're doing is making it a crime for six repeat offenders to keep offending. Right. You know, people would like to keep their purses and their windows. You know, like the other day, uh, my mom and I went out to dinner the other night, and... Um, we, uh, uh, you know, restaurant we ne- I don't think we'd ever been to before, and uh, 
guy walks up and he, I don't think he was really talking to us. He was like talking to the employees. Yeah. And he was like, uh, somebody broke my car window while I was eating here. And the, the lady goes, oh, that happens. Not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, is there anything we could do? Maybe we could show you some, can you make a police report? Yeah. Just, oh, that happens. I always looked at her and I was like, yeah, sure you want to eat here? Seriously. That's a terrible customer service. I went out and moved my car underneath the, uh, like a parking light or, you know, inside the parking lot. And I was like, I want to sit next to the window. I understand that, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily the business's fault. However, if that is happening, don't you think they should have cameras? Right. You know, at least a modern day business should have cameras on their parking lot, you know. to It's a chain restaurant that probably doesn't give a shit. That's uh that's unfortunate. I won't say what their yeah. name is, but I'll give you a clue what it ends in. Lur. I have to think about that later. They might serve sizzling food. Oh. <laughs> wow. This is a, a, a sizzling. No, I'm not going to say it. Practically just did. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, I haven't been there in years. We used to go there a lot when I was a kid. Honestly, it was a, it literally was like, oh, just see where one is. We we ran that's right. The last that's time was that <laughs> one was um, Oakland. Oh, I'm sure. Elza and, Elza and I went down there for a film festival, and uh, and the only thing we could find was a Sizzler, and it was uh, it was interesting. It was kind of like eating at a Walmart. Um, yeah. We did. We actually went to a different one after after that. And there's one a new one that's over here. Oh, yeah. It's the old Hooters. Oh really, dude? It's super nice. Yeah, dude. Like the one across from the mall. Yeah. Immaculate. Really? Yeah. I guess where I'm going this weekend. Right. <laughs> so, uh, more on the, on the homeless thing. Uh, I hate to harp on it, but we've just had uh, two fires recently, you know, that, that were caused. And they're like near here, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of them was the uh, the Pipeworks Rock Climbing Gym right that, down uh, 16th Street on the way to town, which is very close to the Loaves and Fishes Shelter, which traditionally... Very close that, to it. That... That area between 12th and 16th has always been Skid Row. Right. You know. Well, past 19, yeah. whenever they rebuilt. But. When they moved everyone north. But now, I mean, to, to think there's this, uh, there's a, that business has had problems there, obviously, but, but nobody's setting it on fire. Somebody just tried to set it on, did set it on fire and uh, this structurally damaged one side of it. They have to repair it. I thought that was like an all brick building, wasn't it? Yeah, but one side of it is sheet metal. Oh, okay. so there's a brick facade, but there's there still one, sheet yeah. metal, okay. And so, anyways, that did a lot of damage. The other one was I was just watching a fire in a residential area today. They had um, it was right here live, on, by off one sixty, wasn't it? Yeah, a live yeah. Live chopper, and so it was you know by near the freeway, but also near some homes and uh, in this area where a homeless like, camp had set up. The best way to show you an example would be like pretend like this pillow is a grassy area. This is the freeway. This is like a big major road. These are all houses, and it was burned like this. Yeah, if I was in one of my, if I if they were my home there, I'd be one. I'd be just outraged at the city because literally it seemed like right along the side of this house was yeah. a homeless encampment. Now, well, I, that, there's that little tributary that yeah. runs through that area. Yeah. That's that. That's where they all lay. They go through because there's water. It's just. You know, I feel terrible about about. I um, heard that. Yeah, I wonder if the microphones picked it up. I feel, the cats are having issues with each other. Right. I, I feel terrible about anybody going through um, homelessness. It, it is an absolute terrible thing in this, well, con- that, this that's country. Is- cities. I don't know anybody who really handles it well or is doing anything you know right about it. But well, I feel like the only time you ever hear anything right about it is yeah. you hear these like, and I'm only going to say a town because it seems like a small town to me, yeah. like. Um, is it Lodi that has the good camp that, that that's actually being monitored by the city? Oh, I don't know, but I was gonna say like I know that like um, like Cheyenne, Wyoming, took a bunch of those mini homes yeah. and made it for homeless veterans. Okay, and you hear like there's and there's other places and it may not be Cheyenne, well, Wyoming. We we have it right down here. We we have a couple of uh, very small you know setups that like were like communities that. and exactly. they have to like the tiny homes that have. And you have they have to be drug free and they're monitored, but it's 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 not enough. I mean, that just this right. sheer amount is is becoming overwhelming. But but the point I was getting to is that 
when when do you say enough is enough and and you know i'm sorry you're going through a hard time but now your hard time is destroying my business is destroying somebody else's home what gives you the right to camp in, in front of my house or in front of my business or you know or even in my neighborhood park because that's my park that's yeah. your park that's this community's park but suddenly that becomes like the campground for the homeless and i hate to say it but homeless and what happened to kicking people out at parks after dusk? Well, the um, what was it the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals or whatever yeah. made a ruling like a year ago saying that it's not illegal to camp anywhere, so they can pretty much camp anywhere. They can't be kicked out because that's like the thing. Like I'm speaking of Facebook friends, I had one I don't know a week ago or so, and he lives uh, more south down I five, and he was like, "Oh, I'm supposed to bring my daughter to this park," and it's like. Uh, like you said, tents, people with clothes yeah. on strings. Uh, he took pictures of needles. Like, it's not he was like, I'm not bringing my daughter anywhere near here. No, it's, it's, it becomes a hazmat zone. Yeah. Not only do you have human feces and, you know, anybody who's, you know, had any history lesson or bio, you know, you know that that's going to cause diseases. But then, like you said, not only that, but, but needles everywhere, too. So, I mean, yeah. if you're walking around and all of a sudden a needle goes through your foot, guess what? You got hepatitis. You have right. AIDS. You know, suddenly your life is in danger because some some piece of shit left their needles around. Mm -hmm. You know, and so not that they're a piece of shit because they're homeless. They're a piece of shit because they left their needles needles around. And there's plenty of exchange programs in every city. Well, and you can clean up after yourself. Here's the thing is most of the, I mean, kids pulled like, I think I want, this is no, no exaggeration. We have a very small creek called Arcade Creek. And uh, some some kids from a local high school pulled something like eighteen tons of trash out of this creek, and it's all because of homeless. This tra- this isn't trash that like flowed down from somewhere yeah. else. They can This was all because of homeless camping inside of Amer- uh, Del Paso Park near uh, near the, near that creek, and it, it's just massive amounts because they never clean up after themselves. They never take no. their trash out of there. I'm sure there are some that do. Most of them, I think, are either living in cars or they have their own carts that you see them pulling around, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But a lot of a lot of them just go in and absolutely destroy an area. Um, right, you know, at the base of um, Del Paso Boulevard, there's a there's a, a trailer park. Yeah. On the river, there. If you go right, there's actually a, a little park back there, right. right next to it. Yeah. That's been completely taken over. You can't walk those trails anymore. The homeless have pretty much blocked off the trails. The park's unusable now. You know, it's funny as I, I don't think people, we've talked about this before. I work in Davis and there's a, there's a small, uh, I don't know, subculture, if that's not what we're going to call them, of homeless people in Davis. Yeah. Um, but you don't see them like shitting on the floor or shitting in the streets you don't see them causing a ruckus. Well, you 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 were, just before we started recording, you were just saying you were at a ball game and you and you saw that. Oh right? yeah, we went. Well, that was San. We went to a Giants game about two weeks ago, and uh, it was like coming out of the parking garage. There was a, a homeless person taking a a dump in the alley. There was walking, and we were an eighth of a mile from the stadium. We saw two people pooping. Then on the way back, people were walking their dogs, and they just took shits, didn't clean them up. And here's what's happening, right? The whole city is covered in shit. It's covered in shit. And and that's a study that just came out, what, three, four weeks ago? One, I think it's it's, it's shameful. Any Anybody who is a, a pet owner who doesn't, right. you know, clean up after your dog, you know, that's, you're, that's just shameful. But at the same time, if you're... If you're walking around that city and you're watching human shit all over the street and you're supposed to pick up your dog shit, I could see where you're probably like, well, F this. Yeah, right. You know, what? what is the point? You know, oh, I got to pick up Rover's crap, but here, you know, um, Giuseppe or whatever the hell the guy's name is, you know, taking a, t- taking a friggin' dump. Yeah, it's, it was it was pretty disgusting. And it was like, I was like, oh, that's why I stopped coming. I mean, you know, I spent a lot of my, my pro wrestling career in the Bay Area and Oakland. And yeah. I mean, there's... I've seen it all. I mean, I've seen people shoot up. I've seen people urinate. I and I mean everywhere. A guy, a guy passed out with a, a vivid one was after a show one night. We were at um, 
Oh, uh, what's that burger place? Um, it's like twenty. Burger King. No, 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 no. It's like a twenty-four. It's kind of like an in and out. Hamburger Mary's. No, no, no. Is it called Nations? Nations, I believe. A Susie Burger. No, I think it's called Nations. I think that's the name of it. Uh, there's one in Jack London Square. You go in there after a show, and there's a guy passed out and a girl passed out, and they're kind of leaned up. And at first, you think, oh, okay, they had too much to drink. Cute couple. But you get up closer to them, they both shot up. Oh, and they're needles still hanging. in hanging from oh. their arms. Then you're like, oh, they're a drug addict couple that's homeless. Yeah. And I remember I was like, hey, man. And the guy goes, looks at me and goes, it's Oakland. What the fuck? Do you? And he goes, it's the Bay Area. What the fuck do you expect me to do about it? It's just ridiculous. And I was like, I uh, can't wait to go back to Sacramento. <laughs> I, but hold on. Let me go back to my Davis yeah, thing yeah, though, with the homeless. You see him. Uh, one time in five years of working out there, one of them was like, hey, man, give me some money. I don't even carry my wallet with me when I work. Yeah. I said, hey, man, I literally have, I think I even like, Look, I didn't have a wallet on me, dude. And he went off on me. There just happened to be an officer sitting in, it was a jack in a box. Yeah. And, like, he knew him by name. Yeah. Because he said, like, you know, hey, Ted, chill the fuck out. Leave the guy alone. Yeah. Right? Uh, later on, he came up to me. He said, hey, man, if he if he ever gives you any problems, you call me. No, he wasn't going to beat him or anything. Yeah. But he just was like, it was that was their relationship with them was. He keeps tabs on they, them. They, they know who they are. Yeah. They keep them in check and they leave them alone. Because yeah. they don't cause problems. You never ever yeah. see like issues in Davis. You know, it's. With um, the homeless. A lot of people, if, if anybody at all is watching this this podcast, you, you can watch uh, on Netflix. They have like uh, Love and Hip Hop. Or no, that's. These, these a lot, lot of hip hop. A well. lot of shows have, have there's been some documentaries too about the history of hip hop, or or even you know just the history of, of uh, people talk about what New York was like in the seventies and eighties, right? You know, and so I grew up you know uh, about an hour outside of New York, and, and went to New York a couple of times in the seventies and eighties as a kid, and that's um, that's the time of Fort Apache, the Bronx. That's the time when Escape from New York came out. Mm-hmm. And it really was a rough kind of, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, really, wasn't like, uh, uh, I don't know, was it Times Square and all that? Wasn't that pretty much almost like Skid Row? Yeah, exactly. It was like, it was Skid Row. There were a lot of, a lot of drug addicts. Ju- Giuliani is the one that came in and cleaned that up, right? cleaned all that up. So, so before, before that, it, it was ru- like, w- rough. What, it wasn't, wasn't even, um. Broadway almost kind of like yeah it was it was seedy seedy but like people and, uh, still went because it was Broadway exactly so it was rough back then and anybody you ask anybody like the city was almost bankrupt you watch some of these documentaries I mean they paint it like New York was just you know no man's land and certainly uh, I you know I went into the Bronx but that's the other thing about New York they show all this stuff with these burnt out buildings what they didn't show you was if you point the camera in the opposite direction just on the other side of the freeway is a long, very old Italian American community with white picket fences and nice little homes, and so is that Red Hook. Yeah, I'm not sure. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, my, I went up there to see see some uh, some relatives. And anyway, the uh, you're on that Cross Bronx, Bronx Expressway, and you can literally look one side; it's burnt out buildings and desolation. And the other side was these nice little neighborhoods. Is the American is the American dream? It was the, the freeway literally separated these neighborhoods, and it, it was it was well. Crazy it's almost that way. it's it's almost like like if you go, I mean, where we're sitting now in Del Paso Heights. Oh yeah. I mean, you. I mean, the, your neighborhood, I would say, would be a moderately okay neighborhood. If you're being generous, I'm talking about your street. Yeah, your street, street in general. Okay, it's okay. Your street general. We go what six hundred yards that way to yeah. the west, and I wouldn't walk through that neighborhood no. with a Glock. You following me no. in a tank? Yeah, no. You know, it, it gets, I mean, I told you that time that when I had that old white Monte Carlo, that time that I drove through that backside, oh, and man. I they literally stopped and I heard them say, "What's that fucking white boy driving through our neighborhood for?" Yeah. I, I drove through there with my Mustang, uh, and you, you, like you said, everything stopped. It was literally, you want to talk about, everything uh, stops. 
the best example I always say was like when Debo ends up on coming through Friday and it all ends up being slow motion. Yeah. That was like how I drove through. Yeah. Everyone stopped in slow motion, just looked at me. Yep. Oh yeah. No, I don't I know it. I live in this neighborhood and, and yeah. so it's the Mustang. I've got the the, the yellow Jeepster. I drive that thing <laughs> You know, that's hello. <laughs> Wait, does the Jeepster actually actually run? What I did have it run, <laughs> okay, I, I did okay. take it I took it down clay, which clay can be, you know, kinda Oh yeah, but it's not that bad. But anyways, the point back to New York is that I'd seen New York in the seventies and eighties, and in the uh, very early eighties, I think eighty three, we were or eighty four, we were able to take bicycles and ride through Central Park, New York. We took them up, you know, attached to the car, got out, rode through Central Park on our bikes, had no problems with any homeless. I, in fact, the only one homeless person that I really remember seeing was this this crazy looking long haired old hippie guy who had a box piano on wheels and dragged it into the park and was playing piano for everybody. He was a busker and, you know, and he was clearly homeless, but that's literally the only one I remember because we stayed to central inside of central park and we stayed by the, uh, the business district. We ate it like, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention the restaurant. People think, you know, we had money. We didn't, but, but the, uh, no, we didn't. So we, but, nice. no, it's, but uh, so, anyways, it, it was. What I, the point is that even back at the time period when New York was supposed to be at its worst, um, like it, the, the homeless were sort of kept in check. Yeah, or they I, kept themselves in check. And or? the and the criminals. I mean, everybody knew not to go into Central Park at night. We knew well, that. Yeah, I mean, they had the whole Central Park Five thing. I and, have watched yeah. enough SVU. I would never go into Central no. Park at night. So, so that everybody knew, you know, you get out there before it gets dark. But during the day, we we rode our bicycles through there. It was beautiful. It was a great experience. How, um, you know, I've actually never been to New York City. No, of all the traveling I've done, it's like one of the places. It's just I've flown over it. You gotta have a lot of patience, you know. For me, it's just too much of a crowd. Too much, you know. Everybody's seen those Wall Street scenes where everybody's like holding their hands up and screaming over each other like that. That's a deli trying to get food. You're just trying to get get a, a breakfast sandwich in the morning. That's your your average deli. Uh, you know that's what it's it's like in there. You're you're in a, a sea of people just to get to the front thing, and you gotta yell. So I don't know. I'm New York's. You know that, and I grew up like I said in the time period where most of New York was rough. Yeah. But you know there were still some areas that everybody was able to go to, and enjoy. It seems like we're letting the. Um, Unfortunately, we're letting the the, uh, the seedier side of the homeless, which are the right. mentally ill and the criminals that are hiding within the po- homeless population, we're letting them ruin some uh, some really beautiful parts of our city here, and uh, including the American River itself, and that needs to be brought into check. Um, we can do it humanely. Yeah, we can do it compassionately. We can treat each person like an individual, you know, and say, you know, why are you here? Let's get you somewhere else. And get you some help. And if you're the chronically homeless that doesn't want help, or they say they call it resistant to help, then there there is a classification of this thing. Apologize for that interruption, but um, we just need to find a way to be able to handle this properly. I mean, six to eight hundred thousand dollars instead of doing a test to find out where some shit comes from, um, we could definitely just create some more housing for the homeless, right? Some more shelters. Give them their own restrooms. Exactly. You know, how about just throw use that eight hundred thousand dollars to put restrooms along the American River? Something, you know, something. You know, uh, it, it, it seems like a. I'm not going to say it's an easy fix. It's a simpler fix than the city or county or state or got, well, got federal government is making it out to be. Yeah. And I am not sitting here saying kick everyone out, blah blah. blah but there's got to be places and beds for them and places for them to sleep where they can use a restroom at, you know That's once a day yeah. yeah we have to deal with this whole you know you can camp anywhere thing that no. that's just absolute ridiculousness we're not living in the 1800s you know these aren't pioneer days we yeah. can't live like that we can't let anybody else really live like that either sorry the wilderness is not free for you to just crap all over kill the kill what's there eat all the turkeys whatever yeah uh-uh that that that's wilderness and it belongs to the everybody, mm-hmm. you know, and not just you because you're out there and down on your luck. Um, we'll get off this topic. Right. We uh, 
we want to, I wanted to talk about the Stephen Avery case because that that just popped up in the headlines uh, recently. I know you you today. Yeah, you actually this sent morning, me the, uh, the the first link this morning. I saw on that. I got to give a, a big money Bill Monroe the credit for sending me the story. Oh yeah, yep, he's the one who who uh, thank sent you. me. Thank you, big money. So I think uh, so. If you don't know, Stephen Avery is the subject of. Uh, making of a murder. Making of a murder. Uh, Netflix documentary. Netflix, Netflix documentary series. Series two. I believe two seasons. I don't think there's a third one yet. I'm sure there is. Um, and it's basically about Stephen Avery, who originally was falsely convicted of attempted or of rape and attempted murder um, of Penny Bernstein. Penny Bernstein um, in 1985. Five. Yeah, 1985. And he spent. 18 years in jail for that until he was exonerated. Uh, DNA... DNA set him free. Right, which, you know, DNA at that point was 9 years old or so, 10 years old, because he sort of came out during the OJ trial. Yeah. Now, that's when it was popularized. Now, the, 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 that documentary um, basically paints the uh, that that county that, that he comes from. Montawak, is it? Manawak. Manawak. They... It paints the sheriff as, you know, at best incompetent and um, at, at worst corrupt and malevolent. And as long as the DA as well. Yeah, the DA as well. This guy, Avery, was uh, was no um, Boy Scout. No. You know, even from the beginning, he, uh, you know, was it burned his own cat alive, um, was in some burglaries. He was a burglar. Yeah, he, uh, he threatened his cousin with a gun. Because she supposedly was spreading rumors that he masturbated on the front lawn or some shit like that. Yeah. You know, just really almost like Jerry Springer kind of stupid shit, but some hillbilly type stuff. Yeah. And uh and so the the he had a bad reputation. So when this this uh this rape and assault happened on Penny Bernstein right. and he fit the description, she identified him in uh in a photo lineup and then and then a physical lineup, right? right. Uh I I, I only remember both. the photo lineup. I, th- I thought it was both. It could be. It's it been a while since I watched the and, first and season. Certainly, she would have had to uh, testify in court, right? In order. For oh yeah, because you get to face your accuser. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, he was exonerated by DNA evidence, but the guy must have looked so much. And then they, they look similar. Pictures. They look they similar, similar. You know, I'm, I don't know if I. I mean, again, I'm not, I wasn't a woman who was traumatized, yeah. but I don't. I don't think I'd have been like, oh, he, that's him. Yeah. But that that's that's yeah. also. I'm not excusing what happened to the guy, but at the same time, it's he he had a history of being a being a dirt bag, mm-hmm. and then this happens, and this woman says identifies it him, says yeah. it's him. So what? I mean, what are you going to do? I can't fault the uh, the the police department for. For that thing, even though he was, uh, he he was he was suing right for yeah, like some thirty eight million dollars, I yeah, believe, so, was the... a massive amount of money that he was suing uh, for that. Now he never even got to bring that that case up because he was then convicted. Mm-hmm. Was it two years? Is it two years after he was uh, set free? He, he was, he was arrested in 05. Yeah, he was released in 03, Arrested in 05. So two years later, he's arrested for another murder. Now, right. Now this is uh, Teresa Halbach. Uh, Halbach, I believe. Yeah, Halbach murder. She uh, she was a photographer, right? She is. She was like a uh, like I almost I don't know like auto trader. I think was the yeah auto trader is a good 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 uh, example there. Now this is what I find fun. They're not funny. Nothing about this case is funny. But what's interesting is that this happened in two thousand five. And in 2005, I guess not enough people had cell phones with cameras on them so that there still was a position yeah. for a photographer to go out and take pictures of cars for, for ads. When nowadays, yeah, anybody just go out and take the picture of your own car, and post it on. Put, put it on Craigslist or, or, or even want ad or, or bring a trailer or whatever. Yeah. But the point is, is that that's how much changed from 2019 to 2005. That That's... um. Well, I want to say it was even by the time 08 came around, you probably would have... Would have had it. Yeah, you know? I, I, mean, I think cameras kind of came around around 05, 04, 05. Yeah. But still, it's like... Well, by like 2012, I was watching a, a documentary uh, called, I think, Searching for Sugar Man, well, where they had shot part of that documentary on an iPhone. Yeah. So, it, it doesn't seem like it was that far, like it was about to happen, but no, but not if people had it yet. And there still was that position as a photographer. And this, this yeah. young woman was that photographer. 
she went to Stephen Avery's business. He he, uh, he ran a um, auto dismantler kind yeah, of wrecker. Yeah, I'm going to say like a wrecker or auto, yeah. Like, you would take your car there after a car accident. Is that a wreck yard? Yeah, it's yeah. salvage yard. Salvage yard. I think that's technically what it was. So... The, uh, he was in the, in the salvage business. and uh, This whole family she, is. She, yeah, she was there. The whole family apparently had bad dealings with the local law, I guess. And Well, they were sort of the, the, the not really, they were sort of like the outcast or the. Well, you know, the way I, I hate to say this, but I mean, I, I grew up in, uh, in Tom's River and there was a family called uh, the <laughs> around uh, my friend Brennan's house. And uh, this family, man, they, all these guys did was was create havoc and cause yeah. problems and then i remember being in some other neighborhood where it was like the <laughs> family where, where there were the pieces of shit you know and it's, it's like it seemed like every neighborhood you, you go you had you know like the troubled family the, yeah well the, the ones who are either going to straight up assault you or rob and steal from you or the, you know the shit bags i hate right. to say it so the avery's were kind of like the shit bags of monowoc county right and uh and you know Uga, you know but that doesn't make it right that he did 18 years for a crime he didn't commit. However, he looked like the murderer. Mm-hmm. The victim identified him. I don't know how you, you know. And in 1985, there was not a lot of uh, ways to, yeah, you know. So anyways. They're the, also not yeah. a family that has money where they're going to be able to get the best defensive attorney. Yeah. Well, I mean, they had a salvage yard, you know. That, yeah, but, but I don't, I, you know, I don't think they're. Still, yeah. there one Manawatak can or what the hell it's called Whatever. in Wisconsin. You know, hey, that's, that's more uh, one more salvage yard than I have. Right, it's true. So, anyways, the um, the, the what's going what's going on now? He was convicted. Oh uh, seven. Two, 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 yeah, no seven. Two years after he was released uh, or exonerated from the first crime. From by DNA. No, he was arrested two years later. Convicted four years later. Okay, so. So he's back in jail again, this time for life without parole, and with his nephew. Right. Um, Dassey is his last name? Brennan Vassey. Dassey, I thought it was. Anyways, this kid, um, his his intellectual capacity is questionable, at least in the in the documentary. They made it seem like, like he was slow. And um, I think. And, and apparently the, the police coerced him into uh, confessing, saying that, you know, so, as soon as you confess, you can go home and watch wrestling or whatever he wanted. It was, to well, he wanted to go home and play video games. Play video games. It so. was. So they told him it was. They they didn't give him any food or water. I want to say it was 36 hours. They didn't have him for 36 hours. They, he was a. He was. A minor, wasn't he? Yeah, they, no, they, yeah, they didn't. He had yeah. no attorney. So I thought they had him for cup, but they for a few hours anyway, and then they brought no, the, the it was mother in. Hours and hours. So, anyways, it's because of this kid's confession. Hey, um, if I'm wrong, just tell yeah, me I'm wrong on this video. It, it's because of Brandon's confession that his him yeah. and his uncle are, are in uh, in prison, prison for the rest of their lives. So now we have this this new guy. What was this new guy's oh, name? Man, hold on, I gotta look it up. He's I don't this guy, it's it's so weird. Joe, you, uh, you see no, these headlines. The first headline was that somebody confesses to the murder, right? So Joseph Evans Jr. confesses to the killing of Teresa Hallback uh, in a letter to uh, Zellner, Kathleen Zellner. Now Kathleen Zellner is the attorney for Stephen Avery, right? Now, apparently, uh, this this guy, um, what's his name? Something Junior. Joseph Evans Jr. Evans Joseph Evans Jr. Uh, first, I saw something where he was a, a convicted serial killer. I don't. That doesn't appear to be the case. Apparently, he the only person that I saw or read that he killed was, was his, his wife. Yes, but that was the only thing I saw too. But he killed his wife in like '09, or he was convicted '09, something around, around those time periods. It's an '09 murder. Supposedly, he says that he uh, he accidentally hit Teresa. Hallback. Hallback in 2005 with his car, which caused her to hit her head on a rock and die. And apparently he, he's the murderer. And he, and he set up Stephen Avery. And he set up, or he didn't, I don't know, I guess he must have set him up because, you know, it was uh, her car and, and her remains were found on, on Stephen Avery's property. So, anyways... That sounds ooh ah, exciting, but if you read the rest of the article, it turns out that uh, 
the first thing this guy mentions in, in his letter, because this was all done in a handwritten letter to uh, Stephen Avery's attorney by, by this guy, Evans. And uh, the first thing he mentions is the $100,000 reward for information leading to, you know, the conviction of Teresa Halbeck's, you know, our real murderer. And so that's automatically suspicious, but he goes even further. He not only wants that 100000 but he wants 250000 on top of that once, you know, the whole... And he wants $2,000 put into his yeah, commissary and, right, right now. Right now, right now. But in the meantime, just so we can... What how does it say? Our partnership? So we Partner. Can, our, that way we, we can... Uh, continue our partnership. Yes. Yeah, so so he basically has tried to extort her for two grand right away um, to his commissary prison account so he can buy Twinkies and uh, and cigarettes, and then uh, and then he's he was he honestly thought he was going to up the ante from a hundred thousand to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, an additional two fifty above that for information for him to step up and basically fall on the sword and say I did it right. So, and if you don't know, if you've never watched the documentary. Kathleen Zellner is a pit bull. Yeah. She's, she's she, nobody to mess with. I mean, she is a stone cold killer. And, you know, in the, in the terms of she ain't messing around. No, and which is all the more reason why I, I, I think Stephen Avery did it. I, you know, I don't know if we've, we've talked about or weighed in on this before on another episode, but I, I got to weigh in on the side where it, to me it looks like he did it. I think we talked about it before, and you said the same thing. And I am, I'm Team Avery. Yeah, I'm Team Avery. Okay, yeah, no, I'll go with the 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 DA's office on this one. So yeah, uh, anyways, so that at least for now, uh, Avery and Dassey are still in jail and will remain in there. And this Evans guy, uh, his so-called confession seems to be completely incredible. Well, and I think I, the thing with I'm trying to find where she, because apparently she posted the thing, but I can't find her Twitter, um, that she basically laughed off the letter and like posted it on Twitter. I think Stephen Avery w- was laughed was laughing after she read it to him. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, you know, even the, you know Steve, who's you know in jail for this, even him, even he's laughing at how absurd right this particular confession is. So that that's just a hoax, folks. Yeah. Um, some absurdity there. Oh, let's see. Hold on. Uh, oh, he also sent deposit slips. I'll send you this photo, Phil, that uh, he wanted uh, the money deposited into his account at the Wisconsin Department of Corrections money order and ch- and deposit slips. Yeah, this guy is definitely trying to, to work somebody. And so, like you said, uh, that's the wrong woman to try to work. Oh, man, I mean, like I said, she is a straight up stone cold killer. She will she will bury you and no offense. Uh six feet under like uh, I wouldn't mess with her no. you know so but yeah it's it's one of those really one of those funny things that this guy thought he could uh, extort and that's the other thing he's gonna pick up an extortion charge for telling her I need money deposited in my in my slip you know what I mean? or in my my commissary at the at the corrections facility yeah but you know it, it just becomes one of those funny things that somebody oh there goes Phil's phone that was the text I sent him um you know this guy is trying to get a little bit of fame he's probably on the verge of I don't know if Wisconsin murders people or not or uses the death penalty but Maybe he's on the verge of getting the old lethal injection and just trying to save himself from it. Well, and I, I, I can't help but uh, think, you know, he's thinking that somehow he's going to be able to profit from you this. You can't. You can't. And, and nor, nor can his family. No. You know, if he has any left after killing his wife. So right. I mean, so I don't know. I don't know what. To me, it's just it's a publicity stunt, I guess, is what it. No, I, it I'm a complete. You know, reading the article this morning, I was like, "Oh wait, sweet." Then it was like, 
Uh, never mind. So. So. We're going to wrap it up on, on a, a dark local note here. Um, we've had a, a local uh, college student from the area, from, from North Sacramento here, was murdered uh, three days ago. The name was uh, Sincere Dixon. And uh, his murder is still at large here in, Sac- in North Sacramento and Sacramento. So if anybody out there happened to watch mm-hmm. this little tiny podcast and knows anything about it, do the right thing. Call the police department. If, even if you leave an anonymous tip, um, let them know because this uh, appeared to be a good kid. He was off uh, at college playing football and just was home on vacation visiting his family and someone someone took his life. So a real horrible thing. Awful. Very bad. So if anybody knows who, uh, who killed Sincere, please do the right thing. Call the police department. Even if it's anonymous, drop a tip. And... Uh, you got anything else you want to talk yes. about? Yes. If you are a police department or a police agency and you have a Tesla, remember to charge it. Oh, the Tesla, the Tesla. This is a lighter note. This is our lighter note. We're going to end every podcast with a lighter, a lighter note. note. A, a department out of, uh, what did I say, San Bruno? I forget. You, you did send me the article. Uh, uh, one of the like local San Francisco departments near... Uh, have, yeah. Has a Tesla. Yeah, so apparently if the rest of the country doesn't hate California enough, and we know how you hate us out here. Um, Our cop cars are Teslas now. <laughs> now. Now we're using Teslas as police cars. Um, I was joking with Jared. It's like, what, the, what What? police department has the budget to buy a Tesla? They must have had it given to them. I'm telling you right now how to be. I mean, that Tesla's not far from where this happened. Yeah. So I'm saying it was donated. There's Or yeah. somebody bought it and donated it maybe they paid tesla for it and got it donated but yeah there's no way that a department spending one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars on a vehicle like this no the the car running out of juice was not the car's fault apparently no. whichever officer had gone off of shift uh hadn't had the opportunity or the and they all fair to part of the, whatever they did say they're like within six months of the trial of even having the car yeah and it's just one of those things that Guys aren't used to, to having charging a, a vehicle, a so, so. Um, I think electric cars are, are a great idea. I think even having um, Priuses. I mean, honestly, if the difference between a Prius and a motorcycle isn't isn't much, no, you know. So I mean, well, why not why not have a Prius? And if for anything for inside of a city, that's nimble, small, can move quickly around it. Nothing accelerates faster than an electric car, right? So, I mean, I'm all for it. I think it's a great idea. And eventually, I think we're all going to be there, whether we want to want to be or not. Yeah. We're going to be, I don't, I don't know if it'll happen in our lifetime, but I think, I think maybe the end of our lifetimes, Phil. It's happening faster than, than everybody wants to, to realize it. But this is why te- Tesla, whether they go out of business or last or, you know, or let, stick around for another 50 years or whatever, they are going to be down in history as the ones who really made electric cars uh, real s- sexy. I hate to say the word. Americans, especially, we don't want to buy anything unless it's unless it's uh, sexy. Right. And what I mean by that is that you have um, when Teslas started beating supercars in the quarter mile, suddenly that's that's um, all Americans can can res- uh, respect speed. Right. So when when well, that when that Tesla went out and stomped on a Ferrari in the quarter mile and and stomped on a Lamborghini in the quarter mile, then suddenly you know now Lamborghinis and Ferraris and all these supercars are hybrids, mm-hmm. not because they're trying to save gas, but because they need that electric torque to get off the line, you know, as fast as the electric cars are doing it. Otherwise, would you want to be driving around in a Ferrari that somebody in a four door sedan Tesla, you know? with their whole family in the back can beat you yeah. from light to light with. I mean, that I have to admit, that's what I like about the Hellcat, and that's what I like about the Tesla. It's like you can take it to the track and take your family along for the ride, right? right? So, well, and I think, too, is like the, 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 the electric car is just better environmentally. Absolutely. It's kind of top off the... The, the environmental mess that we're in in Sacramento with the you also the, have less less moving parts right so you have a sim, simpler technology it, it, it's a much simpler technology than the internal combustion engine when you really get down to it yeah and uh, and so there here's the question yeah. if Teslas drive themselves 
Oh my god, that's the other scary shit. You see the stuff on the news where they where they pull up next to a car and the guy's well, sleeping. The guy's completely out. So if the Tesla drives itself, does that mean the officer doesn't drive? Oh, oh in the car, right? That's a good. That's I mean, good. like, how does like what does the officer do? Does the officer drive or does he like put in coordinates that says like? Well, here's an idea. You know, that's a good point. Can the Tesla make an officer more efficient? Because right, he could be multitasking then. Yeah. He could be like, all right, you know, take me over to this next call. And in the meantime, I'm going to finish writing up this report. Right. That's uh, the future, right? Well, I, I think the future are these robot things that we're, I keep seeing. RoboCop is Boston, the future. Boston, was it Boston Robotics or Mass Robotics, whatever. They keep showing these robots you can walk over and they won't fall over if you push them. And, really? Oh, yeah. And they can walk and open doors and pet dogs and. The world is changing so fast that, that Blade Runner is going to be here before we know it. It's, it's crazy. Real, real RoboCop. Yep. We'll just see it. All right. Well, I think that's enough for tonight. All right. Sounds good to me. I'm Alexis Drevko. And I'm Phil Lissara, and we'll see you next time on Cities of Blood Podcast. Nice to be with you. Try it.